Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Devine. I'm a fertility specialist, obstetrician and gynaecologist on the north side of Sydney. I work at IVF Australia in Greenwich and I also have my own rooms in Manly Vale. I have a special interest in uh, several areas, but one in particular is fertility options for gender and sexually diverse people. I've been working in this area for many years and it's a great passion of mine. So I'll be talking to you tonight about a number of options that are available um, if this applies to you. So welcome. Uh, we've got an opportunity at the end to answer some questions. So you can send questions through and uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll be able to answer those for you, at least some of those for you. So, just making my talk work. Okay, so just a little bit first about IVF Australia. So IVF Australia um, is uh, a, a very well-known fertility organisation and provides comprehensive um, and supportive donor programs to assist anyone who needs donor sperm or eggs or embryos or even if they require a surrogate to help them have a baby. Uh, and we also have a very um, good fertility preservation service. So if you're someone who is um, considering fertility preservation for one reason or another, but certainly and specifically, um, if you're someone who's thinking about starting or um, has started affirming medical or surgical therapies, then um, we can have a chat with you about um, freezing eggs or freezing sperm um, sometimes even freezing embryos if that's something you'd like to do. And then those can be kept for many years and thawed when required to help you create a family or build to or added, um, build or add to a family. So we'll start by talking about couples and singles who require a sperm donor. Um, and we know that uh, there are many ways of um, achieving a pregnancy without attending a fertility clinic, but we do recommend coming to a fertility clinic because it, it is a safe and effective way of achieving a pregnancy using donor sperm. We have sperm that's been um, screened and tested, uh, and we know it's um, sperm that works well, and we know that if you're using that sperm, you're not exposing yourself to um, any infections, and as well as that, we get screened for um, carriage of genetic diseases. So you can, if you're going to use a sperm donor, you can um, have sperm donated by someone that you know, and they would then come through and have counselling and screening done. Um, or we have a number of um, a number of databases or a number of um, cryobanks that give us access to sperm from overseas. And as well as that, we've got a number of local donors that um, IVF Australia actively recruits from our local community. So we have a local sperm, international sperm, and then of course you can always um, use sperm provided by someone that you know. Uh, with our, our specific IVF Australia database, you can look at donor profiles and there's quite a bit of information that you can find out about each available donor. So you can see here just with a picture from our website specifically talking about the donor sperm program. And over on the other side there, you can see that there's a baby photo or a little childhood photo and then a, a lot of detail about, um, about a, a, a particular donor. So that's the sort of information that you can get. Now, who can be a sperm donor? If you're thinking of, um, of becoming a sperm donor yourself or in fact using a, um, a friend or someone that you know as a sperm donor, um, it's important to know that, that, that sperm donors that we use here at our clinic need to be over 21 to donate. Um, and you shouldn't use a relative um, or, or someone, from a, a, someone from a younger generation, so someone like your, your nephew or something like that, because there is always the concern there that someone may feel an obligation to do that sort of thing. Um, as well as that, we like sperm donors to be healthy. Um, it doesn't mean they have to have no um, health issues whatsoever, but in general to have good health um, and also not carry genetic conditions that can be passed on. Um, we all have a propensity to, to various things through our family. So you can have a family history of high blood pressure or diabetes, that's fine. But it's specifically if you have um, specific genetic diseases within your family that can be, be passed on, then um, we would do screening for those and advise um, it in terms of those results about the appropriateness of being a sperm donor. 
So our recruitment program for sperm donors is very active. Um, sperm donors that we use, that are clinic recruited, we refer to as being de-identified. So you don't get to meet that person. Um, but that person does, by Australian law, have to agree to being contactable uh, when a child that's, that is um, born as a result of that sperm donation reaches the age of 18. So that donor um, doesn't have to sign up to have a relationship with that child, doesn't have to sign up to ever meet that child, but does have to agree to have contact information available so the clinic can access that for, um, for the child. There's a, there's a real push in this nation, in, in Australia, it's really important that um, children that are born as a result of, an, of a sperm or an egg donation are able to access information about their biological heritage. And even the sperm donors that we use from overseas, um, for them to be compliant with Australian law, they have to agree to having their information available um, by the registry. So sperm donors that come through um, uh, undergo screening. They have some counselling, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they also undergo screening um, for various infections, but also for genetic conditions. Um, and they have screening before they provide a sample. And as well as that, they have some screening just um, in a post quarantine period. So the sperm that is used is quarantined um, for several months. And then at the end of the quarantine period, some, there's some more screening that's done. Sperm donors who come through are, are always counselled about the, these requirements. And just a little bit about the law around donation. Um, in Australia, uh, you're not allowed to be paid to donate anything. So you can't donate eggs or sperm or, um, or in fact, be a surrogate um, or donate a kidney or anything at all um, and receive payment for that. So we regard donation as an altruistic um, gift. Uh, we have a central health register in New South Wales that, um, that oversees all ART clinics, all assisted reproductive clinics, and um, any uh, donor conception cycle is um, registered through that, that particular register. There is a five family limit, which means that if you want to be a sperm donor, you can only donate to fa five families worldwide. It, if you want to be a sperm donor in Australia, you can only donate to five families worldwide. Um, so that does put some limitations on the, the international donors that we can, um, we can use here in Australia. These are all um, very specific laws. Uh, and as well as that, it's mandatory that if you're coming through to donate sperm or eggs, or in fact be a surrogate, then um, you must undergo some counselling. Uh, it's not scary counselling um, and it's not psychoanalysis or anything like that, but it is just to go through some of the logistics of what it means to be a donor, what are the requirements of you, um, you know, as a donor, you're not regarded as a parent um, and you're not expected to be a parent, but what is what are the requirements that you do need to fulfil in, um, in coming through to be a donor? Uh, and talking around this, I'm not necessarily just speaking to people who are considering being a donor. It's also people who may access um, donor gametes um, need to know about what the, um, what the requirements are. Okay, so what about some treatment options that you can have using donor sperm? Well, there are a number of treatment options. Um, people generally come through first uh, if they want to be pregnant and uh, would try an insemination cycle because that tends to be more straightforward and easier than undergoing IVF. Um, if you undergo three insemination cycles and don't achieve a pregnancy with donor sperm, then you are entitled to a Medicare rebate if you come through doing IVF. So a lot of people coming through using donor sperm will, will opt to use insemination first. If you're doing at-home insemination with sperm, say provided by a friend, then that sperm is usually put in at in the top of the vagina. But if we do insemination through the clinic, that sperm is washed in the laboratory and spun down to get the absolute best swimmers um, that, that are centrifuged out. And those are very carefully injected into the uterus. So they're injected much closer to where the egg is actually located. Um, and we can do that with someone's natural cycle, determine when they're ovulating and put the sperm in right at the time they're ovulating so the sperm can meet the egg right at the right time. Um, or for people who don't ovulate regularly, we can induce ovulation with some medication. Um, as I say, if insemination doesn't work, um, 
uh, and um, people are keen to move forward to something a little more uh, a, a little more technical, then um, IVF or ICSI um, can be available. And um, you can do IVF or ICSI using your own eggs with donor sperm, or in fact, you can use your partner's eggs if your partner has eggs, and they can be fertilized with donor sperm. And then the embryo can be transferred into your uterus if you're the person who wants to carry the pregnancy. And that's known as embryo sharing. So just a little bit more about embryo sharing. That's sometimes a really lovely way for a couple to have a baby together. Uh, and um, it means that one person in the relationship will have their eggs collected, um, fertilized with donor sperm and embryos created. And then uh, the, uh, an embryo can then be trans, one of those embryos can be transferred to the uterus of the other person in the relationship. So that's a really nice way of doing things. If that's what you'd like to do, it's, not, it's not, certainly not necessary. Um, now, just a little bit specifically about um, options for gender diverse people, not that any of those previous options uh, aren't available for gender diverse people, they certainly are, but um, specifically uh, gen gender diverse clients often come through considering um, uh, having either started or considering starting um, uh, affirming therapies, either medical affirming therapies or surgical affirming therapies. And because um, those therapies have the potential to limit your fertility down the track, then there's been a real push, certainly since 2012 and specifically since 2014, when the World Professional Association of Transgender Health put forward this, um, this statement saying that um, anybody who's seeking to transition should be um, advised and certainly offered the uh, well given the option of preserving their fertility if um if they're going to look at um at, uh, limiting their fertility down the track because of those therapies um so um it's de definitely not something you have to take up um and a lot of people choose not to take it up but it is important to be aware that the op the option is there now um fertility preservation op options are available um in, in a number of medical settings, but certainly uh, the ones that we tend to offer for people who are considering transitioning or in fact have started their transition, um, even those who have completed their transition um, can have options around fertility preservation, but they would be um, freezing gametes, which is freezing sperm or eggs, um, fertilizing eggs and, and freezing those fertilized eggs, which is known as embryo freezing. And very rarely in this setting, because it doesn't make a lot of sense, would be freezing gonadal tissue tissue. Um, the, when we freeze gonadal tissue, we tend to do that for people who are maybe thinking about undergoing cancer therapy, and then would want that tissue re-implanted back in the body. If you're considering medical or surgical affirming therapies, though, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to think about having that gonadal tissue that you've wanted to have removed implanted back in the body. So freezing gonadal tissue at this point in time isn't a really... Um, uh, viable way, it's a funny word to use, but a really viable way of, um, of uh, doing fertility preservation in someone who's keen to transition. Um, just a little bit specifically about sperm freezing. Um, sperm freezing is a, a relatively easy option by and large. Um, it's um, usually just a, a sample that's provided pro provided um, very quickly. Uh, but for some people providing a sample because the sample is usually pre provided by masturbation, for some people that can be quite confronting. Um, and if that is confronting, we have other options. Um, but for people for whom that's not too troubling, we can certainly get a semen sample relatively easily um, that way. Um, uh, if, you, if it's not something that you can face doing, that's absolutely fine. There are ways of obtaining sperm by doing an anaesthetic with a simple operative procedure as well. Um, but the sperm that's obtained in the first way is generally in a better condition for freezing by and large. We will freeze the other sperm, but um, the sperm that's provided by masturbation is mature and um, and is generally better for freezing. However, it, it's a no pressure situation. If that's not something you're comfortable doing, then we can talk around it. Uh, sperm can be stored for many years, um, and we'll talk about a little bit about storage costs down the track. But for, again, for some people, having a stored reminder of their gender incongruent past is sometimes a, a, a little bit confronting as well, or quite confronting. So that can limit options for some people. Some people just don't may have the option presented to them and then decide, no, that's not something I, I really think I want to 
I want to have hanging around, that's absolutely fine as well. A little bit about egg freezing now. Um, so uh, egg freezing um, can really be done at any time during your transition. It can be done before your transition. Um, in the middle of your transition, you can stop tea for a short period of time undergo um, a st what we call a um, ovarian stimulation cycle um, or a gonadal stimulation cycle, um, uh, where over a period of about two weeks, you give yourself some very simple to administer injections. Um, and during that time, you come into our clinic and you have some blood tests and the occasional ultrasound. And it usually takes about two weeks um, of being on the injections and coming in, not every day for two weeks, but so maybe three or four times in that two week period for blood tests and or ultrasounds. And when you've got a, a good number of mature eggs present, um, then we can um, stop the stimulation, trigger ovulation and bring you into our little, um, into our day surgery there to have a minor surgical procedure where you go to sleep um, with a sedation anesthetic and we can remove your eggs without any incisions or stitches. Um, I try when I'm doing this um, uh, to stop testosterone for the briefest possible time because most people who are taking tea don't want to be off their tea for a long time. Um, that can be um, quite dysphoric for a number of people. So we try and stop the tea for the shortest amount of time. Certainly if you're planning on egg freezing and not planning a pregnancy subsequent to having eggs collected, um, then... Uh, then you can start your tea as soon as, really as soon as you've um, uh, undergone the procedure. The eggs are taken up to the laboratory and frozen um, and you can resume back where you started two weeks ago and just get, get, get back onto your tea and take it as normal. We can store eggs for a number of years, certainly for 10 years, um, but if you need them prior to that, um, then you can absolutely access them at any time. So, and then, then there is the option, of course, of freezing embryos. Um, embryos do freeze very, very well. And that would be for someone who, who was happy to um, freeze their eggs, but also fertilize them with either donor sperm or partner sperm. Um, and so, uh, but, but it's in specifically, that would be if we're talking about someone who's having eggs collected for a fertility preservation procedure. Um, if you um, uh, wanted to, preserve embryos and um, you are someone who produces sperm, then if you have a partner who produces eggs, um, we can fertilise your partner's eggs, we could fertilise donor eggs. So there's a number of options available, just depending on what you, you have and what is required. Um, but most people who come through for fertility preservation, I would say probably don't do embryo freezing. Most people are freezing eggs or sperm. And certainly embryos as well can freeze for at least 10 years. Now, just a little bit very briefly about young people, teenagers thinking about fertility preservation. There's certainly been a push over the last number of years to encourage young people who are thinking about starting puberty blockers or thinking about um, uh, starting affirming therapies to um, consider the option of fertility preservation. And we always recommend that to young people who are um, thinking about puberty blockers or affirming medical therapy. However, um, we tend to find that most young people, most teens are not taking up the option of um, uh, freezing eggs or freezing sperm, and that's very understandable. Most of them um, report to us, and the studies that we've done have certainly shown us that uh, most young people who are going through uh, a transition or considering going through a transition are feeling really overwhelmed just about everything, but also about being a teenager, um, uh, coping with school, coping with exams, coping with peer pressure, um, coping with all the other things that, that adolescents have to cope with. And having to then turn around and think about their future fertility can sometimes be a little bit too much. As well as that, um, not all young people, as you'd be well aware, have family or other support. So it's difficult for them to, um, to you know, make decisions around their future fertility when that's the least of their priorities and a number of them would also be concerned about costs. What's reassuring is there are Medicare rebates available for um, fertility preservation in this setting because it's most certainly um, uh, uh, the, the right sort of reason for having a, medic, a Medicare rebate. So um, if you have any concerns around that we'd be very happy to discuss that with you. 
Now, just a little bit more about um, if you don't require um, sperm or you don't require um, fertility preservation, but you're thinking about having a pregnancy um, as a couple or a single person and what you need to make that pregnancy happen would be an egg. Um, we, um, what you can do is use an egg donor. So uh, the majority of people coming through um, within this community would probably be two gay guys, but um, certainly there's a number of different um, uh, family groups, couples and singles who could require an, an egg donor. Um, so egg donors in Australian clinics are often recipient recruited. So people would recruit um, a, a friend who's happy to donate an egg. Um, but there are, we also have uh, clinic recruited donors and you can certainly talk to us about that. Um, some people would ask a relative, their sister or a cousin to provide a donor egg. Um, but certainly um, if the egg donor clearly can't be a relative of the person who's providing the sperm. Um, and uh, there's also the option of the donor community online. So there are uh, people online who are happy to be egg donors for couples and for singles, uh, and uh, also people online who are through the donor community who are happy to offer a surrogacy um, uh, cycle for people as well. Um, a number of overseas clinics have egg donors who are paid to donate eggs. So they may be paid, um, say, $5,000 to come through and, um, and have their eggs collected, which can then be used by um, people who require an egg donor. Um, paid donation, as we've said before, is, isn't legal in Australia, but it's not illegal for Australians to go overseas and access um, eggs overseas if that's something that that um, it works for them. Just remember though that um, unless those embryos that are created overseas are fully compliant with our very stri stringent donor laws, um, then we're not able to ship those embryos. So if you do go over to say South Africa and use an egg donor over there and create some embryos over there, um, if that South African egg donor is not compliant with Australian laws and most South African egg donors aren't because egg donors in South Africa have to remain completely anonymous and cannot have their information made available down the track. So people who do go over to South Africa to use a donor egg can't ship those embryos over to Australia. So if they have a child through that um, donation process um, and then want to go back and have another child with one of the frozen embryos, they have to go back over to South Africa to use those embryos rather than have them shipped here. Um, who can be an egg donor? Um, ideally, we like an egg donor to be someone who is younger, um, Not uh, certainly not you know, in adolescent years, they need to be um, over 21, ideally between 21 and, and 38, because um, eggs uh, deteriorate as that person ages. Um, and when people get into their 40s, their egg quality certainly is getting um, fairly rough. Uh, most, uh, most successful egg donors tend to be younger people. Um, and ideally, we like an egg donor to be someone who has completed their family. Um, uh, but it, it, that's not an absolute requisite. So um, some people will use an egg donor who hasn't had children. We do recommend that they have, um, but uh, it's certainly not laid in stone that they have to have completed their family or in fact have had children at all. We don't want um, the egg donor to be a relative of the sperm provider. We mentioned that before, and certainly not someone who's um, 17 or 18, uh, you know, a niece or someone like that, that that, that's really too young to be making that decision. And again, as with the sperm donors, um, people um, can certainly have things like asthma and, and things like that, but we don't want them to have significant health problems um, and no significant genetic conditions, um, things that are, are, are very clearly going to be passed on and cause, cause really um, the sort of genetic conditions that would cause really debilitating illness through someone's life if they inherited that condition. What about surrogacy? People often say to me, oh, is surrogacy even legal in Australia? There's, isn't that, you know, a little bit... Um, surrogacy is legal in Australia, but it's only legal if the surrogate is not paid. Now, they, uh, the surrogate can be compensated. So um, if that person needs to travel to um, access the clinic or travel to see their obstetric provider, if they're going through a private uh, obstetrician and there's costs incurred there, um, those costs can be covered by the intended parents, um, but 
you can't say to someone, I'll give you um, this large sum of money if you'll carry a pregnancy for me or carry a pregnancy for us. That's not legal in Australia. Um, and um, as well as it's important to know that um, a, a fertility clinic can't find a surrogate for you. We can't um, uh, procure a surrogate for you, but we certainly are very happy to, um, provided everything's within our, our laws here in Australia, we're very happy to um, assist you through it. Um, a surrogacy uh, cycle or surrogacy process. Um, for singles and couples looking at surrogacy, the surrogate must have their own children and own living children. Um, uh, and and it, at IVF Australia, the surrogate is not able to use their own eggs. So um, there are more cases of a surrogate being unable to relinquish a child if that child is actually biologically hers, um, or if that surrogate identifies as a female, but um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so we can't use the surrogate's um, own oocytes to create the pregnancy that she carries. So we'd use eggs from a donor, fertilised with sperm, and then that embryo carried by the surrogate. Um, we like the surrogate and the intended parents to have an existing relationship of six months. It doesn't mean if you um, find a surrogate online that you can't use that surrogate but there that does need to be a period of time where you've sort of got to know each other you all require counseling um, and as well as that we don't want the surrogate to be someone who's got significant health problems um, i uh, i remember submitting a, um, a request to an ethics committee for a surrogacy um, uh, cycle and the surrogate had epilepsy that had um, flared up in her pregnancy previously and the ethics committee knocked back that surrogate because they felt that that was um, that was a significant health problem that was going to impact that woman and indeed that was an appropriate thing to do um, and as well as that we really like surrogates to have had um, really straightforward pregnancies and straightforward births so someone who vomited all through their four pregnancies and ended up in hospital several times with each of their um, children or someone who had severe postnatal depression um, wouldn't really be regarded as, as someone who is an ideal surrogate. Um, and um, just a little bit now about carrying a pregnancy. Um, if there is a uterus pregnant, uh, sorry, if there's a uterus present, then successful pregnancy is definitely possible. And that's regardless of whether you've been taking tea or not. Um, you don't take tea while you're pregnant, but, um, but certainly we can stop tea, collect our sites, um, create embryos and transfer um, embryos or an embryo to a uterus very easily. Um, uh, having said that, not a lot of um, trans guys tend to come through requesting pregnancy. Um, it's more common that they would um, freeze uh, freeze oocytes and then use those um, for with a surrogate to carry a pregnancy or with their partner to carry the pregnancy. Um, for people born without a uterus or people who have had a hysterectomy, certainly, um, uh, uh, well, yes, pregnancy and birth are not yet possible, um, but there is certainly um, some, there's been a number now of uterus transplants that have been done around the world with successful live births. And um, so there's definitely some interest around funding research into doing uterus transplantation in trans women. Um, that's certainly a very um, early area um, of research and research funding, but it's a definitely a watch this space sort of area. And just a little bit now about Medicare rebates. Um, the cost of treatment, it can be complex. And um, so I didn't want to put up a whole lot of numbers here on the screen today. But um, uh, certainly cost of treatments vary depending on the treatment that you use. Um, there are Medicare rebates available for donor sperm IVF if you've done IV IUI three times and, and haven't achieved a pregnancy. Certainly IVF is more successful at achieving pregnancy than IUI across the board. Um, and um, so IUI uh, is a little bit more natural in terms of its pregnancy success rates. IVF has higher pregnancy success rates um, across the board. Uh, and at this stage, very disappointingly, there are no Medicare rebates for surrogacy, um, but um, there's a number of advocacy groups that are really lobbying their government strongly to, to get surrogacy, um, at least Medicare, with Medicare rebates and with adequate compensation. Um, and certainly, 
as I mentioned before, before or, or after starting affirming treatments, um, uh, gender diverse people are entitled to Medicare rebates for their fertility preservation cycles. And if you're considering freezing eggs or sperm, um, you pay about uh, $250 every six months for, for the freezing costs. And those, those are not entitled to a Medicare rebate, but that's what you pay. So that's the end of the talk uh, that we were going to do tonight. I'm just going to see if we um, have some questions, and we do. Uh, someone here very kindly has said, can I donate my eggs if I have PCOS? And yes, you absolutely can. Um, Interestingly, PCOS is a condition where those little cysts that we talk about in polycystic are actually little eggs. Um, and so people with polycystic ovarian syndrome tend to have lots and lots and lots of eggs. So um, you absolutely can donate your eggs if you have PCOS. Um, we're careful with people with PCOS because they can sometimes go completely overboard and give us a very large number of eggs if we stimulate them. But if you wanted to be an egg donor and you are someone with PCOS, you're absolutely welcome to come and talk to us about that. Um, how long after having a baby do you have to wait to have a frozen embryo transfer? Really good question. Um, uh, generally, we say six months after a, a normal birth or a, 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 a non-caesarean birth and nine months after a caesarean birth. So we give you just that little bit of extra time for your uterus to heal after a caesar, but um, otherwise it's six months after a, a, a normal birth. How would you re recommend two men looking to find a gestational surrogate with no female family members to go about it? Um, tricky. It can be tricky. Certainly um, ca come along and have a talk to us. There are options. As I said, it's not legal for fertility clinics to procure a surrogate for you, but um, we can uh, certainly um, uh, have a chat with you around things that are available. And there's also um, uh, Growing Families and Surrogacy Australia, which are two organisations that are um, very um, much in the advocacy um, area in, 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 in surrogacy, and they have lots and lots of options for you. They've actually got a webinar. These are a very a big plug here. They've got a webinar this Saturday, um, Growing Families has a webinar this Saturday um, to talk all around this sort of thing. What's available? What can you do? If you don't have anyone that you know who can be a surrogate for you, what sort of options are there? Um, and certainly some people go overseas to um, places like Canada where you can um, uh, access altruistic surrogates um, who are not compensated uh, over and above what you know, the conversation that we talked about, the conversation that's legal um, through places like Canada and, and, other, um, and, and other sites. So, so the Surrogacy Australia um, website or the Growing Families website would certainly be give you lots of information. How long after a miscarriage can a frozen embryo... Oh, hang on. Oh, no, here we go. How long after a miscarriage can a frozen embryo transfer be done? Um, really, um, it depends on the gestation of the miscarriage. But if you, say, had an eight-week miscarriage um, and your pregnancy hormone level comes back to normal uh, and you start cycling again, then you can really, once you start cycling again, um, come through and have a frozen embryo transfer. There's no long period of time that you need to wait to remove toxins from the body or anything like that. Once a miscarriage is complete and you've got your cycle back, it's okay to then attempt another pregnancy. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if we've got any more questions there. Um, anyone else got anything that they want to submit? Um, I was cognizant of the fact that we um, had to sort of keep this within half an hour, so I, I, um, I wanted to move quickly on on. Uh, on what we were presenting, but um, please feel free to contact IVF Australia in Greenwich um, to make an appointment to see me, or I have my rooms in Manly Vale. Um, if you can go to the IVF Australia website or um, my own website, I'm very, very happy to see patients. I'm very happy to provide advice. Um, a lot of people just come along not really wanting to do anything, just to get some information about what's available. Um, if you want to talk about this further, then... Um, it's very, very easy to come through and have a chat. So, um, but um, thank you very much for attending tonight. Uh, and um, I look forward to seeing some of you soon. All the best. <laughs>